So good afternoon everybody. Um, welcome to this week's Great Ormond Street Hospital Grand Round. Uh, my name's Simon Blackburn. I'm a consultant paediatric surgeon here at Great Ormond Street. Um, I'm Director of Medical Education and Deputy Director of the Great Ormond Street Learning Academy. And it's my great pleasure to introduce a talk about aerosol generating procedures in the era of COVID-19, which will be given by our colleagues from ENT and anaesthetics. Um, and kicking us off to start the talk is Andy Hall. Great, thank you very much. So we'll uh, just just load up the presentation. Um, but certainly we're absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to introduce some of our ongoing work here, um, uh, looking at aerosol generation procedures um, and, and really to talk a bit about, in terms of setting the scene, how our group came together um, to look at this issue. So next slide, Claire. So over the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to take you through some of the science and, and outline our approach to an issue that in reality, few of us had spent much time considering in any real detail before March. And, and what we're really looking to, to show here is some of the evolution of our understanding and some of the stories on what collaboration opportunities exist at GOSH. And when it comes down to it, what we're talking about here is the fact that aerosols aren't new. And what is new is the level of interest we've given them and the fact that we have recognized the potential for them in the operating theater environment to have a direct effect on us um, as, as well as our patient population. And to start off with, um, what I'd like to do next slide please, Claire, is um, to take you back to early March, 2020. And these were back in the days when Zoom was just a noise that kids made when pretending to drive a car. And within ENT, we used to think of ourselves as pretty low maintenance when it came to uh, operating. We'd tend to require pretty simple or minimal levels of personal protective equipment. In paediatric ENT, many of our procedures weren't even sterile. And, and certainly in terms of what we wore, this would often be individually selected by the surgeon or team members. We were necessarily gown for every case but we would use aprons and certainly as you can see from the pictures here there's some variance in terms of how we performed our regular surgery and although assessing and treating pediatric airways was a huge part of our workload with attendant aerosol exposure our attention to risk in this scenario was um, often restricted to quite specific circumstances such as when we're using the laser or considering papillomas but doing what we did, largely we turned up to work when we said we would, and we didn't get sick. Next slide, please. So in terms of what we've experienced is coronavirus arrived, and um, much as, uh, as all of us, we were, to say we're on the back foot would be putting it quite mildly. Um, the situation that we were faced with was when there were concerns about healthcare workers potentially becoming infected. We were in a situation where many of us hadn't necessarily gone through the fit testing process or had a great understanding of the difference between FFP2 or FFP3 masks. And very quickly, there was this realization that potential COVID cases within theater environments could potentially impact the whole team. And this in itself obviously brought about a degree of fear and, and uncertainty in general. So when we're thinking uh, about COVID-19, what we saw was obviously a, a spate of articles and in, information that started to come through from various professional bodies um, and the science research publications, giving us some assistance in terms of what we should be thinking about. And this term aerosol generating procedures suddenly became very in vogue. And although it had been discussed in the past, it was one that for, for many of us, we hadn't paid perhaps as much uh, attention to as, uh, uh, as we had other areas. And uh, next slide, please. So in terms of what we're talking about um, for an aerosol generating procedure, what this is is a, essentially a high-risk procedure. And um, this came from work looking at the SARS um, epidemic back in 2002-2003. Uh, um, and in this um, situation, uh, what was seen were that um, individuals um, that were involved in certain procedures had a higher chance of actually catching catching the condition itself um, and in particular the areas that were looked at were intubation but obviously one of the concerns for us in 
um, ENT with a very routine microlaryngo bronchoscopy procedures that we perform looking at the pediatric airway in which there is this prolonged aerosol generation that we're reliant on in order to um, keep the patient breathing so that we can adequately assess what's going on further downstream and, and, and treat the patient accordingly. So in, in this in mind, we are thinking in terms of viral particles um, and viral load. And work that's come through here um, certainly uh, initially was talking about the, the modes of transmission and, and direct contact and droplets were well covered from early on, but aerosol remained an ongoing concern from us. And indeed, um, the WHO um, uh, updated statements were on a regular basis suggesting that aerosol transmission was, was something that we needed to bear in mind and, and really look to focus on in terms of these viral particles. So in terms of what we're talking about here, we're talking about um, the potential for virus to be spread in droplets or small drops of liquids, as well as um, these fine liquids or solids um, within a gas. And we know that some of these were felt to be airborne and also that humans can inhale these at different sizes and where they get lodged within the respiratory system will partly depend on the size of those particles. And actually what we were seeing is a lot of the information was based on what we didn't know. Unfortunately, the viral load in aerosol from highly infected SARS-CoV-2 is unknown and the viral load within asymptomatic carriers was also unknown. The thing that we did know at that time is that high viral load sites were pretty much those that concerned anaesthetists and ENT surgeons and, and respiratory physicians um, in particular. And so with all this in mind, you are focusing on the potential delivery um, of, of the viral particles through the surgery that we were doing. Um, you were focusing on the viral particles themselves. And obviously you, ha you also had your protective mechanisms. And here you had your armor. Um, and the three of us uh, within the group here are, are shown demonstrating that. And this was something that again came through this early work. So thinking about these areas, we were obviously looking at, at what circumstances we were due to be faced with. And sure enough, the first COVID patient arrived in the hospital. And this first COVID patient um, was a unintubatable ex-prem neonate that required us to to use the information that we've recently obtained um, and work together with the operating team in ENT and anaesthetics, the scrub staff, the ODPs, everyone around the hospital in order to um, help ensure that that patient got the care that they needed whilst protecting uh, members of staff. And certainly these early experience of COVID um, felt very different from what we felt was normal practice. And we wanted to help others in this situation and, 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 and wrote this up. But despite of this, what we realized is that there were still lots of uncertainties in relation to aerosol generating procedures. And a lot of the science lacked clinical context. And these were things that we needed to look at. And this was the part where us as clinicians were able to influence and modify and collaboration was gonna be key to this. So within ENT, we've got longstanding engagement with the fantastic simulation team here at GOSH, who've been involved in delivering regular in situ simulation um, with us but also we've been working with them on use of simulation beyond training in itself, focusing on issues of uh, problem solving within the hospital or potentially assessing new technology as pictured here with some endoscopic um, uh, laser measurement equipment using some simulated um, mannequins. And, and certainly the key thing here was well, could simulation help us at this point? And what we did is we collaborated with, with lots of different individuals and this was a really exciting process um, knowing that there was a, a lot of an area where there was little information and we felt that the expertise here at Great Ormond Street could help us um, really um, put some put some information together and, and help ourselves and, and and other teams and certainly one of the huge benefits of Great Ormond Street is you've got experts in every corridor and with every zoom and we had a really unique and important opportunity we felt we wanted to use and next slide, please. Um, and with that in mind, certainly what we were looking to do uh, was to improve our understanding of occupational procedure exposure to patient generated aerosols and working out how we might minimize exposure to the patient ger generated aerosol within the hospital. What we're looking to do is help visualize what was always there. The difference is, is that everything is being viewed in the context of the COVID positive patient and the effect that that can have on staff. So 
what we're looking to outline and what um, Claire Fraunfelder, who's one of the senior paediatric fellows here at Great Ormond Street's worked tirelessly on are a series of, 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 of videos heightening the awareness um, of aerosol and, and how um, this may impact us within our environment and looking at the ways that we can look to reduce this at source. So I'll hand over to Claire to take us through more on this. Lovely, thanks Andy. Um, so we essentially, sorry I'll just get our slides to move on. So we, we drew some inspiration from um, a paper that looked at uh, aerosol escape um, for patients who are tracheostomized or using high flow circuits um, and came across the concept of fugitive aerosols. Um, this paper also described really nicely a method by which a model could be used um, and uh, an aerosolized um, counter could be um, could be incorporated into a, an outwards breathing model. Um, and so we decided to put some saline in that um, and Bill will, will present the details of the model itself. Um, but you can see here that very effectively using um, some white light, we're able to see um, the aerosol that's generated um, within the model downstream and coming up and out, sorry, through the nose and mouth of the patient um, and is, is backlit using some light. So we took this and we applied it to several different, uh, uh, different experiences that we have every day in the operating theatre um, and incorporated both anaesthetic and uh, ENT procedures in these. So if we look firstly at, at the patient just breathing in and out, um, we've set up a laser um, at the end of the bed um, and this is just in Theatre 6 at Great Ormond Street. You can see that the two metres between the, the patient and the light source um, and you can clearly see here the aerosol coming out of the patient and um, that the light is picking up and also um, the way that the, the eddies of airflow um, disperse this throughout the operating theatre. Um, and the first time you see this is um, it, it can actually be pretty confronting thinking about what's coming out of each of us when we breathe in and out um, in the operating theatre environment. So if we take something as simple as jaw thrust um, we can see here Andy um, working on the model um, and opening up the airway um, and without any PPE on um, you can see that the aerosol spills over him um, and is dispersed uh, over his hands up into towards his mouth um, and then um, disperses out throughout the room and moves on fairly quickly. So this, this picture in particular um, is a good reminder as to exactly why we do wear PPE when we're anywhere near a patient's airway. In terms of simple things that can help control dispersion of the, uh, of the aerosol in the operating theatre, um, simple application of the, the mask to pre-oxygenate the patient um, by using good technique um, and getting a good seal, you're actually able to, to stop aerosol dispersing, dispersing throughout the room. Um, and also I think the current anaesthetic guidelines are actually just use a two-handed technique, um, which again, you can see here is really effective. If we move forward to um, the insertion of, of an LMA, this is something that, that happens in lots of different environments, not just the operating theatre. Um, and we can see um, around the LMA itself, um, that there is, there is some leak of aerosol because you haven't got a perfect seal within the airway. Now, um, there's been a, a bit of debate and, and my understanding is that uh, LMA insertion is not considered an aerosol generating procedure. Um, but you can see that the size and the fit of the mask um, and the style of LMA, whether it's an eye gel or, or a standard LMA, is going to impact the amount of, of aerosol that, that leaks as this is protecting the patient's airway. So this certainly is something that, that will help um, move towards the, the use of, a, of, well, sorry, to support the suggestion to use endotracheal intubation for patients who are COVID positive or where the status is unknown. If we have a look at the, the process of intubating itself, um, you can see this model um, is being intubated. The patient is paralysed at this point. So where after the chest is recoiled, um, the actual, the fact that the patient is not spontaneously breathing at this point means that there isn't actually too much aerosol spread at that point and that when we compare intubation of a paralysed patient 
to a spontaneously breathing patient. We can see the, the difference in, in aerosol dispersion over the, over the proceduralist. Um, and this is important uh, to consider, but also in the, in the setting of um, choosing when it's safe to paralyze the patient before they go off to sleep, um, but the, the role that PPE protect, takes in protecting the person intubating. It brings us to, to um, something we'll touch on really briefly, and that, that's the, the amount of innovation that, that was widespread and, and every WhatsApp group and internet uh, uh, um, forum was filled with people um, putting forward models and suggestions to, to help protect those who are intubating. And um, certainly this, this um, model here is an excellent one produced by our craniofacial colleagues here at Great Ormond Street. Um, the, these play a, a really important role and particularly when we didn't understand what was going on um, were quite reassuring for people to use. But I think um, some of more recent literature is starting to come out and say that to, to really consider the role that trapping aerosol in this plays, um, and you can see underneath the sheets here that aerosol is, is trapped and this model is designed to have a suction um, running under it to try and evacuate that. Um, but particularly when removing this um, how that would disperse aerosol throughout a room. Um, and also from the video with videos we've seen, you can see that the laminar airflow in theatre is an important mechanism to protect people. Um, and by using barriers like this, that stops that flow over the patient that would normally disperse aerosols that, have, that are um, produced. So it's just worth keeping in mind. In terms of extubating a patient, um, we demonstrate here a, um, a simple and safe method of extubation. Um, you can see that the clear drape is, uh, is in place and you can still safely observe the patient and, and perform the procedure. And you can see here now some of the aerosol that is spilling out of the patient um, and is being captured nicely by the sheet. Um, if we look here, the, you'll see a side-by-side -side demonstration that um, as it's coming up, that the quite a bit of aerosol is captured um, using the drape. And as we think about it and, and think back to the way that that drape is removed in that particular example, um, you would then have an, a, a plume of aerosol dispersed. So it, it's worth keeping each step in mind. So not just trapping the aerosol at the beginning, but also then the way any protective measures are removed. Bear huggers came up as a question and saying, well, look, if you, if you look at the activation of a bear hugger, there's certainly um, flow of, of air coming off of the um, bear hugger and the concern was whether or not they should be used. This is a simplistic model, but you can see here that by activating the bear hugger, there really was no effect on the aerosol dispersion. I and mean, then that, that also relies quite heavily on the laminar flow in theatre. So we certainly wouldn't um, recommend not using one and making sure patients remain um, normothermic during their procedures using it. If we look quickly um, at two ENT um, specific um, types of procedure, um, you can see that uh, in this model, you can see why as ENT surgeons we're concerned, we're sitting right at the head of the bed um, and aerosol spilling out as we work. And you can see that um, on the still on the uh, on the left side, there you're able to see the plume coming out of the patient, um, and we'll come up again and see all of the laser light um, that demonstrates it will come through in just one second. Um, and you can see the operator would be sitting here and would be covered in aerosol. So the the role of PPE for us is particularly important. Finally, to touch on an outpatient procedure that we do, and that's nose endoscopy. Um, this model um, is a little bit like uh, a nasogastric tube insertion. And you can see here that normal breathing, um, the ENT surgeon is, is in the patient's face and that there is some spill of normal breath of the patient um, over the operator with aerosol, but simply applying a mask and snipping a very small hole um, over the nostril area um, allows droplet and aerosol to be captured and to decrease the amount that's, um, that's spilling over um, the person performing the procedure. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Bill Walsh, who's our um, anaesthetic colleague, who uh, has been collaborating with us to describe exactly how we, um, how we designed and, and came up with the pictures and the model. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, hi, I'm Bill, and I'm a fellow in anaesthesia and simulation at Greater Ormond Street. 
and I'm going to talk about model design and image generation. So the first thing to say is that this project would not be possible without input from multiple GUSH teams. So we've had involvement from ENT, anesthesia, simulation, respiratory medicine, physiotherapy, and respiratory physiology. So working at a place like GOSH really helps make a project like this become a reality. So the aim was to simulate spontaneous respiration in a five-year-old child. So as the patient, we used a high fidelity pediatric airway mannequin. And as the lungs, we used our standard operating theater anesthetic machine. We used nebulized saline to generate a visible aerosol. And we had two sources of white light from different directions to make it easier to see this aerosol. We also had a green laser light source creating a two-dimensional plane of light to demonstrate aerosol movement with theater airflow, and this is really cool to see. So to simulate spontaneous expiration, we connected the breathing circuit of the anesthesia machine to the mannequin trachea. Then we put a spirometer between the two to measure the expired volumes we were generating. We selected ventilation parameters and fresh gas flow rates to mimic comfortable breathing for a five-year-old child. We also incorporated an aerosol delivery system into the circuit creating aerosols with a median diameter of one to five microns. So the strength of our model is that it allows evaluation of aerosol dispersion using different anesthetic techniques and proposed protective interventions, like we demonstrated during our videos. For example, the cuff, the inflated cuff in the tracheal tube or the use of a protective drape for extubation. Our model is low risk to investigators. It's portable and can be easily used in theater, ICU or emergency department settings and it can and hopefully will be incorporated into future studies of viral spread. The limitations of our model include that it is anatomically and physiologically a simplified model. We cannot simulate coughing, and currently we have no particulate counter to quantify volumes of aerosol generated. However, we have a grant application process to secure such a counter. So in the future, we're planning to undertake quantitative studies to measure aerosol exposure of healthcare workers. To do this, we will nebulize salbutamol and attempt to measure the quantity that would be inhaled by a healthcare worker in the operating room. We've simulated healthcare worker inspiration using a nippy clearway cough assister device. These devices generate a negative pressure to augment coughing and secretion clearance in patients with neuromuscular disorders. We've calibrated them with a spirometer to mimic adult tidal inspiration. So nebulized subutamol inhaled by these cough assisters can be captured with bacterial filters that are used as standard with these machines. The mass of subutamol absorbed onto these filters can be determined using spectroscopy. So thus we can compare relative amounts inhaled by healthcare workers at different distances from the model using different airway devices. Our experiments will be carried out using a range of airway devices at two key distances from the patient. Airway operator exposure will be measured at 45 centimeters. We arrived at this distance as it was the mean distance we found for 21 anesthetists who intubated our mannequin during a preliminary story, study. It was also the mean distance of three ENT surgeons performing an MLB on our mannequin. Circulating staff exposure will be measured at two meters. This is also the original social distancing advice by Public Health England. We hope that this will demonstrate a difference in exposure with distance from the patient. I'd just like to say, personally, that it was a really great experience working with so many different teams to get our model to a point where it is now ready to carry out these experiments. Now I'll hand you back to Clara to summarize. All right. So we wanted to leave you with a couple of take home messages um, about aerosols and, and there are certainly um, plenty of staff members who've been um, quite concerned about exposure and particularly occupationally. Um, but aerosol plays just, just one part of, of the picture of transmission of, um, of COVID-19. Um, our understanding of the disease is improving at all times and, and it's important to remember that community spread at the moment is much more likely um, a route of transmission, um, particularly for members of staff who work at GOSH, um, as um, the prevalence in the paediatric population we know is low. Um, environmental exposure plays, plays an important role um, and particularly looking at um, the ventilation within hospitals um, uh, which has been studied uh, now extensively. Um, we know that in places where there have been high numbers of, of COVID-19 patients um, that, that, that the areas that are well ventilated can clear virus quite effectively but those that 
that aren't ventilated and have poor airflow um, don't clear the virus and they, those areas can be reservoirs of, of um, virus. Thankfully, um, in terms of operating theatres and, and the staff that, that we're looking at, um, the theatres are extremely well ventilated and as our, as our videos have demonstrated, the, the, the air turns over very effectively, um, somewhere between um, 20 and 25 times each minute. And so this is a great location um, for us to undertake this work, work um, despite what we've seen with the aerosol spilling over us while we do so. Um, finally, Great Ormond Street patients are much less likely to infect us than, than we are them. So I think our, our little gif here um, is a good reminder that as um, the increased message from Public Health England and also Great Ormond Street itself um, is to wear a mask, it's very much about protecting spread between ourselves as staff members um, and between staff and parents and also from staff and parents to their own children. Um, and it's quite unlikely that the children themselves are, are going to infect us. Um, as a side note, a quick add, this little um, gif here on the left is available on Twitter. Um, you can uh, go to any of uh, either myself, Colin or Andy's um, Twitter accounts, um, also the Great Ormond Street's official account. So if you feel like you'd like to spread the message to get people to wear a mask, um, then uh, you can uh, you can certainly retweet us. All right. Finally, I'd, I'd like to say again, thank you to our team members. I think it's been a brilliant opportunity to work with a whole range of different people and um, working in a place like Great Ormond Street where everybody says, sure, definitely, how can I help, um, has been an absolute privilege. So. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's just really wonderful to see all of that collaboration going on and fantastic to see the Learning Academy simulation team closely involved with all of that work. Um, just to remind everybody who's watching this that you can put questions up on Slido um, while we're waiting for a few of those, perhaps just a couple of questions from me. Um, is there any evidence for a difference between cuffed and uncuffed endotracheal tubes? Have you looked at that? We have actually, um, and uh, I've, I've got a very uh, quick little video actually I could pull up and show you. So if you give me two seconds, I'll pull that one um, because it's a really impressive side-by-side -side demonstration. Everybody's now going to think that that was scripted, but it really wasn't. <laughs> no, I, we, the problem was we, we've, um, we have... Uh, generated some great videos and to try and pick which ones to include and not um, was really hard um, but that is that is quite a good one so if I show you here this is the cuff up and then as you deflate you can see that the amount of aerosol that leaks out of the patient's mouth are, are, it is quite marked. Obviously, this will differ a little bit between the depending on the size of the child and the size of the tube in the particular child. Um, but whereas ENT surgeons, we're often um, suggesting to other teams if we can get away without a cuffed tube, that would be better. Um, if there's any question about COVID status, um, the recommendation would, would be to use a cuffed tube. And we're also aiming to quantify the difference um, when we undertake our quantification studies with Subutamol. Um, so we'll have runs with the cuffed and an uncuffed tube mm -hmm. um, with the sealed circuit on a circle system. So hopefully the difference will be due to the cuff. You know, there is a difference. Yeah. And the other thing for me was whether the whether exposure to aerosol, um, is there any evidence about how much exposure to aerosol you need to be infected? Because there's a there's a an assumption in all of this that aerosol exposure equals COVID infection, which is clearly the concern that everybody's got. But does anybody have any sense of the correlation between those two things, as far as you're aware? This would be a great time to introduce our collaborator, uh, Colin Butler, who um, hasn't, hasn't spoken so far. Um, Cole, do you want to take that one? Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, I, I mean, the short answer is that we don't know that. Um, we don't know how much uh, virus is actually produced in any of the, um, even uh, in asymptomatic or symptomatic patients at any given point. And so, and so far, 
Um, many groups have looked at whether they can culture virus uh, from aerosol components uh, from patients, but we haven't captured it at the right moment or right time. And clearly, the length of exposure is quite important and, um, and the environmental settings that are in place. So, um, I mean, there's a much area of further work which is desperately needed. Cool. That's great. Thank you. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to bring us to a close there. Um, it was just to, the other thing just to say was that we have a grand round next week. That's Tuesday, the 21st of July. Um, our speaker will be Jennifer Ezekor, who is um, the chief executive of a company called Above Difference, who help public sector organisations um, around issues with diversity and inclusion. So in the context of the Black Lives Matter campaign, that's going to be an extremely topical grand round. Um, those of you who were at the GOSH conference last year may have heard her speak really powerfully at that. So we're really looking forward to her coming and we'll look forward to welcoming you all then. Um, thank you all very much for coming and thanks very much to all of our speakers for such a great talk.